to everyone, uh, Stanley Wines bringing you the 2019 Burgundy Vintage, our last look of the wines from the Cote de Bone. Um, we have assembled another all star cast for you tonight. Jason will be talking through the vintage um, and the wines. We have three winemakers, two at the moment. Hopefully, we'll be a third to follow. Uh, we have Pierre Brisset starting us off. Uh, we have Loic Lamy, uh, and it's towards the end from Soze, hopefully Benoit Rifo will be joining us. Uh, we, we talked, those who were with, with us for the Chassan tasting would have heard Jason putting it into a context of his work in the wine world and how he's seen that village evolve. So if I may kick off and throw a ball at Jason and say, could you comment for us, Jason, on Polini and how that has evolved, how the winemakers have evolved in the wines uh, to kick us off. And then we'll talk about the vintage more and head to the winemakers. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to um, this evening's tasting. Delighted to have you here and delighted to have a nice representation from Burgundy as well. Um, yeah, as Sam said, we did Chassin on, uh, on Tuesday. Um, and in, in many ways, Polini is, is is a more established village, if you like, but I think it's, um, Chassan has really come up on the rails over the last sort of 10 or 15 years. Um, difficult to say exactly why Polini has had such a following um, for a long time. Um, it's it's slightly uh, slightly smaller um, than, than Chassan, it's about, about two thirds of the size, a um, little bit smaller than, than Merceau as well. Um, it's quite a premier and Grand Cruise, of course, um, Grand Cru shares, shares with Chassin, but um, I think it has four in total. Um, the thing everyone talks about in Polini, of course, is, is the water table and saying because it's very high, um, there aren't that many uh, producers who are, or vineyards who are making their own wine because they, they, they couldn't build cellars originally, so they would have nowhere to store the wines. And as a result, there are quite a lot of um, contracts with negotiations. So perhaps there are less, less domains um, than there are in Chassin. Um, I think what I would say is certainly the, some of the classic names in, in Polini have been very uh, dominant over the last, the last 20 years. And um, we're delighted actually to have a couple, a couple of new names here today alongside the very well, the very well established uh, uh, domains. So it, it, should, it should be a fascinating tasting. And obviously, we'll get an insight from the growers themselves because they're much better qualified than I am. But the, the one thing I would say I found fascinating when tasting Bellini, um, I actually found the wines almost richer and slightly more intense than I did the Chassins, um, which is slightly counterintuitive, um, especially as I think the yields will hit a little bit less than the Chassin. So in a way, you would you would perhaps expect them to not to have quite that same level of concentration. But I found an amazing level of intensity and, and, and dry extract again, um, and yet no no loss of terroir at all. And I, um, I think there were some really lovely wines in Bellini, and, and perhaps that delicatesse that you find in the village traditionally um, makes for a great a great compromise with the, the richness of the vintage. Anyway, let's uh, well let's say hello to our first winemaker, if we may. Um, Pierre Brisset, come in, Pierre. Uh, lovely to have you here. Um, you're, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to say, one of the, the, the younger uh, and newer brigade on, on the scene. Could you give us a, a little bit of history of, of your operation? Yeah, I started uh, winemaking in uh, 2014 and uh, I bought uh, vineyards in uh, Chassagne Montrachet to start. And then uh, I'm installed in uh, Chateau de Bligny at uh, bligny le bone just close to Beaune, uh, which is a, a kind of wine lab uh, where we are uh, different uh, winemakers uh, installed. And um, we share the infrastructure, in fact. Uh, we share experience, too, which is very interesting. And, but everybody, everybody uh, makes his own wines. And uh, so this uh, concept was built by uh, Dominique Lafont and uh, Pierre Merger, who make their uh, wine there too. too. And uh, we are about uh, eight winemakers there. Uh, it was a very good solution for me to start. 
uh, because with a, a structure, um, a top structure with all the best uh, infrastructure uh, for winemaking. Is, is, it, is there really a sense of togetherness? That there really is a sharing of ideas? In, in... Every, oh, everybody makes his own wine. So that's, uh, that's not a cooperative. Uh, and uh, everybody uh, keeps his own secret too, in fact. But, uh, but as I was a, a, new, uh, a new winemaker, so uh, I tried to, to get uh, experience from uh, the others. And, uh, and so for me, it was very interesting and uh, very good to start with, uh, with these people who make wine for uh, a very long time and uh, they made it very well. Your, your operation is split between um, some vineyards that you own, but also some contracts you have in place to yes. buy fruit, is that right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. how have you, I mean, it, it's interesting, the, the, obviously the price of land, if you want to buy more vineyards, has risen enormously. The prices are crazy now. But at the same time, and perhaps because of that, the price of fruit has also increased to unprecedented levels. It's especially in a vintage like 2019, where fruit is at a premium, is it difficult to, to source the quality of fruit that, that, that you're after? So I have contract on long term. I have long term contract. So, uh, uh, and I have them for, uh, I begin the, the first contract I started in 14, two, 14 and 15. Uh, so uh, the price is the price of the market. So uh, we have to, to do with it. Uh, the problem is, uh, was not the price in 19, it was the frost and uh, the very uh, low uh, yields. And uh, so the quantities were very uh, low. And uh, so this is the problem uh, with the contract, in fact. With, with, your, con with your arrangements, who, who decides on the picking date? Is it, is it a collaboration between you yeah, and- Yeah, it is a collaboration, yeah. yeah. We decide together, yeah. Yeah. We, we, and, we... Uh, that's why in 19, I start new contract. And uh, especially, uh, I think the wine we will taste tonight in uh, Saint Aubin, yeah. uh, sur Gamay, yeah. sur Roche du Maine. Exactly. We we spoke on on Tuesday about um, particularly with Alex Morrow in Chassan about the importance of the picking date, um, yeah. especially even more so than normal in in 2019, um, and it really was vital to to get it too late because because it's earlier in the season than harvest used to be. Yeah, 24 hours can make a huge difference yeah. to, the, to the ripeness of the grapes. Um, so let's let's talk about about your wine here then. So we've got the Santoban Premier Cru. Santoban is, is an appellation you've been wanting to make for a while. Yes, I wanted to do it because um, I think he has the, the great uh, balance uh, between uh, tension, freshness, and uh, structure, uh, as the uh, Chassagne, in fact, like like Chassagne. I think this is the, 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 the appellations uh, that I like very much and I wanted to do it for a long time. So that's why I started in 19 and it, it is a long term contract and we start uh, and we continue. An interesting question and maybe maybe it's not the right one to ask, but um, be, bearing in mind this is a Pollini and Friends uh, tasting, but do you see more connection with Chassan or Pollini when you when you look at Santobin? More similarities? More with the uh, Chassagne, in fact. Mm. Uh, especially uh, this, um, this part of, uh, of, uh, of Saint-Aubin. Uh, I think we have uh, the, the more balance uh, between the, the generous structure, the freshness, the tension, especially in this uh, odd vintage. Uh, 19. Uh, I see uh, Saint Aubin more with Chassagne than with Pulin, but that might yeah. be. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And when when did you begin harvesting then in, in 2019? It was uh, September 11, I think, 11 or 12. Yeah, yeah. And uh, 
this particular Santo Bad, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, just so, so everyone listening in realizes, a lot of the wines you're making are very small quantities normally. Um, you know, we, uh, I think your Abbe de Morgeau is, is one barrel this year, is that right? Um, <laughs> two, two barrels. Oh, a, a, a plethora of, of. Thank you, the first. <laughs> your, your, Pellini is, uh, your Pellini is one barrel. Yeah. So this is relatively bountiful at, at, I think, almost five barrels, is that right? Yeah, five barrels in, uh, yeah. in 18, five barrels of uh, Saint Aubin. Um, it was, uh, uh, in fact, the contract is uh, the whole, um, the whole part of uh, vines. Uh, so it was five barrels in, uh, in 19. Yeah, on the subject of contracts, someone asked, how long are the contracts that you get to sign for? What duration? It's not uh, written, in fact. It varies from vineyard to vineyard, and it's a collaboration with uh, between two people, and uh, so uh, it's for a long time. But uh, there is no, no, no date, no, no date uh, written. Understood. And in, in terms of vinification, um, how much? New oak are you using? I'm guessing not a huge amount by tasting the wine. Uh, two on five. Okay. Two new oaks and the other were uh, two wines. Okay. Yeah. Two, new, uh, two new barrels and uh, three uh, barrels of uh, two wines. And this, this, this particular vineyard, as you say, is, it, it's kind of above the, the, the little hamlet of, of Gamay. Is yeah. the soil here, is, 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 what is it like? It's a very, um, it's very um, cal cal um, sure. calcare, yeah. It's yeah. very, uh, yeah. Uh, lay, uh, you say. Lay. Limestone. Yeah. 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 And is presumably you're trying to keep that tension, keep that freshness, the minerality, the stoniness of, of the wine? That's why I want to do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Kim asks you to, your a comment on the, uh, comparing eighteen and nineteen as two warmish vintages. Differences, similarities. How were they to work with for you? I had no uh, Saint Aubin in eighteen, so uh, I can't compare the the, the two uh, the two wine. But uh, nineteen, uh, it's uh, it was hotter. Uh, there are more alcohol, right? Uh, more structure. And uh, but the acidity are still uh, are still great. pH are between three uh, twenty five and three thirty, uh, and so uh, we can keep the tension. We can keep, keep the, the freshness, but we have a, stru a great stru a structure. In fact, mm -hmm. alcohol thirteen uh, percent. Uh, my little bottle is telling me thirteen. Is that 13. to be believed? Thirteen point five. Thirteen point five. Yeah. Okay. But compared with 20, for example, at 20, we are at uh, a little bit less than 13. Okay. But it certainly copes with 13 and a half, and I, and I think there's probably one or two wines we'll taste later um, at 14. And um, with that sense of freshness that you mentioned, I think wines are generally really well balanced. Do you see this vintage closing down, or is this a vintage you think will always drink well and we can pull the cork in next year or we can wait yes yes you, you have to wait yeah. or we... <laughs> i yeah. think it's a it's a vintage and you can keep yeah and you have to yeah. right well, thank you i think it's a, a really good debut for for the the santo bar um uh i say i'm delighted that you've managed to make five barrels of this um it will help us uh, ration your wines a little better because with say with the other wines it really is a, a very minuscule amount and we yeah. very kindly given Stannery a, a good chunk of it but uh, <laughs> it was all very small small potatoes um so thank you for the moment uh pierre I'd, I'd, just, I'd just like to say hello to, to benoit we haven't actually uh seen him yet i gather he has finally arrived um all the way from pulini uh, come in, Benoit. Are you there? Maybe he isn't there. 
<laughs> and that looks remarkably like a cellar that doesn't I can't actually you can't actually see anymore. Okay, well we'll leave Benoit and we'll 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 come back to, to Benoit a little bit later. Just as someone who with, with vineyards across the whole of Polini, I think he'd be a he'd be able to give us a really nice breakdown of, of how Polini as an Appalachian has, has fared in, in 2019. Um, let's move on to, to the next mine for now, uh, which I'm going to present because DDA, DDA is, is not here today. So, in fact, this is a wine that's, I mean, I've been working with DDA for well, probably longer than both of us would, would like to admit, but um, it's not something that we've, we've offered before um, at Stannery. We're, we're delighted to, to introduce it now. Um, DDA's father set up the domain just after um, just after the, the first world, second sorry, yeah, second world war. He's not he's not that old, and DDA has been in charge now I think since about, about 1986 1987, um, and he's now got his nephew working alongside him who will no doubt uh, take over in, in due course. Um, so this is the Polini Lagarin. Um, which is a little bit further up the Polini slope. Again, no bad thing in a warm vintage like 2019. Um, the DDA built himself a really smart new um, couvery just in just in his village um, of Gamay, hence uh, hence the vineyard Sur Gamay, which is above the, the village. Um, up until then, until he constructed this wonderful new building, he's operating out of a uh, tiny little cellars back at the, the family domain. So this that was quite a significant uh, development for him and really kind of took him to, to the next level, I think. Um, this is a significant holding for Didier. It's about just over half a hectare, I think officially 0.6. The key, the key element is the vines here um, are relatively old. There's, there's, I think they go back to 1946. But there are also a few younger ones, so there's a bit of a mix in the place he's been replanting uh, uh, from time to time. So funny enough, bear in mind his father um, started the domain back in 1946. I'm guessing it was his father who, who replanted the plot back then. Today's wines tend to be quite quite smoky, quite mineral where the soil allows. Um, he used to say he uses about 20-25% new oak. Jason, have you had aged examples of them? I have done, yeah. Probably, probably no more than five or six years old, more because they they taste so delicious after about three or four. Um, he's got a couple of really nice plots in Santo Bar as well. He's got Merger de Don Chien, um, and then Champo as well, which is really nice. He does make a little bit of red too. Um, I think this is already beginning to show quite well. It's not not yet bottled. Will be, will be shortly. Um, but I think you are getting that slight smokiness coming through, and I, I think there is quite good acidity actually. Um, uh, and the beauty of this wine is it's it's going to come out at a, at a crazy price. Didier's wines are always always great value, and uh, from memory, I think this is this is going to be around two hundred and forty. For a, for a six pack, so it's it's some, something something of a steal. And um, yeah, I think it still remains very true to to Pellini. There is a, a certain delicatessen about it, um, and just a lovely little bite on on the finish. Um, so. Anyway, so that's Didier Verrou's Lagarin, um, 2019. Um, I can now see Benoit. He has he has appeared. Can we just quickly introduce you, Benoit? Um, how how are you this evening? How? Oh, I I do well. And you, everybody. Hope uh, everybody is uh, on good testing and uh, including yours yours as well. If we if we are, we're going to be a little bit cheeky, Benoit. We we we'll be asking Loic to talk a little bit about the Pyre. But could you, as as you've got so many vineyards in Pulini, could you give us a, a little overview of how Pulini how Pulini did in two thousand nineteen 
as an Apanasio? Uh, 19, it's, uh, it's, for me, it's a very special vintage. Huh? Uh, first, uh, first thing, it's, um, it's a little problem in uh, early April with a big, big frost, but uh, in fact, it's, uh, it's uh, so early uh, that uh, don't too much impact uh, because uh, we have uh, early restarting uh, beginning of May and uh, at the final uh, during harvest, we, we have an alpha, an alpha crop that was not too bad. And uh, in Premier Cru, we have no problem with with uh, with frost, but uh, we have not so good uh, flower flower uh, period, and uh, that's why uh, after with dry uh, temp with dry condition for maturity and uh, summer, uh, we have not a lot of juice, and the result it's a uh, half crop too, and uh, in fact it uh, it's a small vintage with quantity, but for me it's. Uh, very, very concentrate vintage, but in a very good way because uh, all parameter are concentrate in the same time balance and uh, we keep a lot of energy. And uh, after, of course, uh, we have a few, few different, uh, few different terroir and uh, each one uh, keep his characteristic. That's why you speak about Garen. Uh, it's perhaps, uh, I don't, I don't have this wine, but, uh, it could be limestone and little bit elegance, I think. And uh, in Refer, for example, you have perhaps more density and uh, clay style. But uh, for me, uh, this vintage keep elegance, keep terroir, keep freshness. It's very strong wine, but, uh, but so exciting. Yeah, I must admit, when, when I tasted with you um, in October, I thought the wines were simply fantastic and I, um, I've spoken to someone else who, who's also tasted your wines and um, there is a slight feeling that perhaps these are some of the best wines you've ever made. Is that right? Yeah, I'm right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't heard good, but sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, but it, it's clear. It does seem to be an awful lot of of ex dry extract concentration intensity probably because of the small berries and also this wonderful freshness and acidity it's yeah and it, it's amazing when you still have when you had so much heat and yet they still taste refined and fresh and terroir driven yeah, you, 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 everybody uh, need have an idea of uh, total concentration. Each parameter is really concentrate. Uh, body first, but uh, intensity, freshness, energy, uh, minerality, all parameter are on the top. And uh, all top balance, it's so special vintage for that, I think. And for me, it's uh, yeah, it's perhaps one of the best uh, never, never, never do by, by this way. Yeah, really. Great. Well, hopefully we'll get, we'll, we'll have a nice allocation. <laughs> a small quantity. <laughs> the finger, the finger. I cross finger, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ben, well, look, we'll, we'll come back to you a little bit, a little bit later. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And, uh, if we can go over now to 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 Loic, who's um, who's up in the Oak Coast, I believe, um, and Loic Lamy is, is from the uh, Domaine de Monti, uh, who are perhaps better known for their, their Volnais and their Pomards, certainly their their red wines, but who acquired some time ago now this wonderful plot of Pyre, which I think from memory was was bought from uh, the main Chart uh, Chaton. Um, you, you'll be able to say exactly when. But, um, Loic, yeah, if you can just, uh, it's a domain with a lot of history. Could you just give us a quick recap on, on the domain? Yes, uh, it is just, uh, I want to say my name is Lamy and there is a lot of uh, Lamy in this um, region. So it's not, it's not linked, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, we're definitely in the, in the theme. Um, so historically, the Domaine de Monti is um, located in Volnay uh, and has its plots around Volnay and Pomar, uh, which is, as you know, uh, 
uh, where, where, where Pinot Noir is doing quite well. Um, the domain, the history of the domain started uh, 300 years ago or so. Uh, and the plot Le Caire was actually, so in, in, in Puligny, was actually uh, purchased in um, 1993. And it's actually the first Chardonnay plot that was acquired by the domain. So uh, somehow the domaine de Monti is still quite uh, linked to, to, to Pinot Noir in most people's mind, but uh, yeah, Caire is a, it's definitely an interesting one because this is the first one. And at that time, it was actually, the wine was made by Jean-Marc Rouleau, I think, wasn't it? So, um, since uh, it, Hubert de Monti and Etienne, uh, so may maybe it can, uh, can be interesting. Uh, I can tell you how he acquired the, 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 the plot because back in the days, um, Le Caillet was, was a monopoly, as you said, uh, by, by, from Chartron. And um, because there was some, uh, some um, you know, um, succession um, questions. Uh, so how, how to transmit the land to, to, the, to the, the family and the, uh, uh, he asked uh, for advice uh, his friend uh, Hubert de Monti, who, uh, who was a lawyer, and, uh, and um, he understood that uh, he had to sell a bit of land, and Hubert said, you know, if I can help, of course, I can, can buy some, and, uh, and it's quite, it, was a, it was quite a good, um, uh, a good match, but he didn't really know how to, um, how to uh, vinify Chardonnay, and uh, at the time, uh, Alix, uh, so it's Hubert's um, uh, daughter. She she was married to Jean-Marc Coulot, and it's quite quite a, a bit of luck to have a, a man like that who can who let's say masters Chardonnay quite uh, quite a lot. And um, he, he helped. He didn't vinify himself, but uh, he definitely helped and gave his opinion on what's a great Chardonnay and how to do it. And of course, they got inspired by him. A lot at the time, and today the vinification techniques are, are not the same. But I would say that they they they, they have in common this idea of uh, how the, the 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 structure of a white wine and the the finish, uh, how how the the length of a, of a white wine is important. So they they they're both really working on this. Um, just to, if you could just say a little bit about Le Caire, because it's 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 a very well located vineyard in Pellini, isn't it? Le Caire is. Um, so if you have Le Mont Rocher here, next to it, you have Le Caire. And right above, you have Chevalier Mont Rocher. So it's really stuck in between two, two Grand Cru. Uh, and 80 or so years ago, when the people of Inao uh, chose uh, which plot would be a Grand Cru and a Premier Cru, it was definitely a question. Because before that, it was considered with the, the the standards of, of, of the time as a, as, a, as a level of a Grand Cru. But there was at this time uh, still some uh, Pinot Noir planting on this plot. And maybe that's uh, uh, kind of um, wow. pushed the, the, the people to choose this, this plot as a Premier Cru. Um, it's definitely a, um, a super Premier Cru, let's say. It's hard, to, yeah, it's, a, it's hard to imagine Pinot Noir being planted there. I mean, it seems now, it seems... It, it seems absolutely crazy. Yeah. And, and when you see the soil, it doesn't really make sense to plant, uh, to plant um, uh, Pinot Noirs there. Uh, but many appellations, you know, the, 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 um, you can, I can talk about Volnay a little bit, but like all the, the higher part of Volnay with the kind of soil might be interesting to plant some Chardonnay. Uh, Burgundy is old, but there are there are still some questions to be to be asked. But if we keep um, if we keep getting these warm summers, you might be planting Grenache. <laughs> we, we are not doing a great job at fighting uh, global warming. That that's for sure. And and that's 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 in my opinion, that's not a problem with Chardonnay. Chardonnay is a, is a great variety. People make good Chardonnays all around the world, um, and even under warmer climates. Pinot Noir might be a bit tricky at the moment. We, we benefit from him because we benefit from from it because um, 50 years ago we were uh, wondering if we could make a wine that would match 13 degrees of alcohol. Now we know that we're gonna get it. It's not a problem. Uh, so so it's making our life easier. 
but in 50 years from now, that's that's going to be tricky for sure. And in terms of farming, uh, De Monte is, is now farming biodynamically, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Um, since, since 1995, uh, the, the vines are, are organic. I think that Hubert always um, didn't like uh, herbicides. So it was always kind of in the mentality of the domain. And, uh, and uh, little by little, and that's Etienne, uh, who, who I think was uh, influenced by, um, uh, by Anne-Claude Lefebvre, mostly, uh, who really took him into, into, uh, into biodynamy. And um, we're not certified, uh, but uh, we, do, we do the practices of biodynamy since, uh, since all five years. I think one of, the, one of the really interesting things about De Monti is actually you have a, an American winemaker. That's right. It's, it's, to me, to me it's, it's absolutely crazy because the, the owner of the, of the estate is Etienne, Etienne de Monti, who, who's 100% a, who's a a Burgundian. And, and on the, 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 the winemaker, Brian Seavey, is, uh, is, um, is American. And somehow they have a similar palette which is absolutely crazy to me because uh, what's, what should uh, a Burgundian consider sweet compared to an American or acidic or, and somehow they understand each other, which is, uh, which is always fascinating to me. They, they really taste the same way. So that's why it's, it's working. I mean, we can, we can discuss the reds briefly maybe, but in terms of the white wines now being made at De Monti, you have more because of the integration with Chateau de Bellini that happened a few years ago. But I've always found the whites um, very pure. There's new oak is, is used very sparingly. And it's all about the tension, the minerality, the refinement. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, uh, again, maybe that's the heritage of, uh, of Jean-Marc Rouleau. Um, also, we, 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 if we talk about a plot like Le Caire, again, we are extremely lucky to have a plot like this because whatever you do in the vinification, really, um, three or let's say four to five years later, the amount of new oak you used, the, the, it doesn't really matter because terroir wins in the end all the time. So, so um, over the time, we, we, we discovered that using around 25-30% of new oak on, on, a, on, a, on a plot like uh, Le Caire, you can't really taste it. Uh, it, it absorbs, the, 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 the terroir absorbs this, uh, this um, uh, the, the, the oak and, and then the tension, the, the minerality, again, the, the terroir is helping a lot to, 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 to lean toward that. And what it, I mean, this to me, this tastes wonderful. I mean, there's a slightly reductive element on the nose, which I love, um, but great purity. I mean, it really tastes like Bellini Morache. Etienne and, and the whole team must be very happy with, with the vintage. Oh, we're happy, and especially in 19, I, I, I agree with, uh, with all the, the, the other winemakers. Um, 19 is, is very warm vintage, so we, we were... I think we were all very excited with, uh, with the Pinot Noir, uh, but with the Chardonnay, the, the question was, will we get this tension that we like so much? Um, just like Pierre, we, we, we end up with a pH around two, uh, three, three point, yeah, 25 or 3.3. Um, so so we, we, do have a, we do have a great, great tension. What, what I love about this, um, this Caire, it, it always, the nose is always very, very profound, you know, very intense, very, but at the same time, very precise. Um, and that's, that was the difficulty with 19, being a lower yield compared to 2018. Uh, 2018 being, you know, a very generous vintage uh, with this, Smaller fruits, um, we, were, we were a bit scared of lacking uh, uh, precision, but, uh, but um, yeah, the, the, the nature was, uh, was really helpful. And, um, and again, this, um, the limestone, the, the, the kind of flintstone nature of the soil um, make this wine precise uh, and extremely, extremely long. It's extremely uh, 
vibrant, you know, extremely um, um, bright, we could say. Uh, it's, it's a word I've been using, say, throughout my notes and, and throughout these tastings, but the sapidity, sapidity, which we would probably translate as, as mouth-watering. And it's, it really energizes the mouth and the finish is, it's not just long, but it's persistent. I, I think that's a really exciting wine. I don't, I don't know if, if everybody is tasting at the same time, but um, it's, to me, it's so really impressive the, 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 how, how both very round and, and, and very energetic this, this wine is. And, and sometimes whites can be either very round and charming or, or very uh, energetic. And here, um, it, it's really the two, um, the two together. Uh, so yeah, it's a... It's a I presume this wine is currently currently resting in stainless steel. Uh, indeed, uh, we we like the the whites to spend two winters in, in the cellar, so it's going to be bottled around um, March probably. Yeah, and just to finish on on, on that, um, when would you start drinking it? Five years time? Ten years? Well, uh, depends how many I have in my cellar. <laughs> <laughs> That would make my life easier. Uh, ideally, uh, I would say it's best to, to, to wait five years. As I was saying before, um, it's important for, for, for winemakers to let terroir win at some point because our work is really to, to guide the wine and, and help the wine meet the, the terroir, really. Um, so, so ideally, I, I would wait uh, at least five years, but 10 years would be, would be a peak and then uh, up to, to 20 years. Yeah, there's great, there's great extraction and tension and concentration on the finish. It's, yeah, it's, it's lovely. Very complete. Thank you, Eric. That was terrific. Um, we'll perhaps catch you just, just before the end. Um, we better crack on. We've got wines number, number four and five. I'm just going to say a little bit of, about, um, and we'll taste them obviously, and then we can go back to the Benoit to talk about the, uh, the Sose Champagne. So wine number four, it's Pliny Premier Cru de Perrier from Philippe Perno of Perno Bellicast. Philippe, well, the name Perno you will certainly know very well. Um, Philippe is the son of Paul Perno, who's still very much um, making great wines in Pliny. Um, he, he, he's still quite a young man, so when Philippe was looking at, at setting up something himself, uh, his father was somewhere off for time, and so. Uh, Philippe got together with his wife, Madame Bellica, and uh, took on their vineyards in, in her family, a lot of whom were in contracts to, to Negocios, and they set up Perno Bellica in, in 2009. So we're on about the 10th or 11th uh, vintage now. And there's no doubt in time, um, Philippe will in, inherit a good proportion of his father's vineyards. I think one or two are already beginning to, to, to filter through. Um, at the moment, it's still a fairly small domain, certainly compared to, to the, the big family domain. It's about six, six and a half hectares, I think, um, spread across mainly Polini uh, and Merceau. Um, and what I really like, I think, about Philippe as well and, and, and the domain is the, the evolution. It's, it's very gentle, but it's quite relentless. Um, Philippe's an intelligent man and um, open to suggestion. He questions things. And uh, every year you see, you see real progress being made. I think there was a big turning point probably in 2014, um, partly due to the fact that he bought a whole load of new equipment, but also because he extended the, the length of Elevage, so the wine spent longer, uh, a little bit longer in barrel, but perhaps most importantly also in stainless steel afterwards where all the barrels are blended together and the wine just has time to settle and almost, almost come to itself, if you like. Um, and I think that just tends to add purity, longevity, um, assistance, probably rather than longevity, um, and just a little bit more complexity. And I think since then, we, it's the same, everything has just moved up a, a notch. Um, Perrier is, in a way, very his sort of flagship in, in Polini. He, has, he also has Champagne and, and Champagne. Um, but this, these, these vines are old. They were planted in 1955, so uh, 60 four years old when, when this wine um, was made. Um, and again, I think there were issues with, with flowering. So 
bearing in mind the vines are already old and we're probably producing very small berries anyway, and with the poor farrowing, there's even more meanderage than normal. So hopefully we're going to see some really nice concentration here. Um, albeit uh, Philippe may be a little bit disappointed that he hasn't made he hasn't made more wine. Um, he began picking. Um, well, actually, he emailed me today. He said he began picking on the 9th of December. I think he meant the 9th of September. Um, uh, so pretty much in that that sweet spot, along with uh, along with everything else. Um, As I said, the wine has now been assembled, so this is the, the finished blend. But there's probably another six weeks or so in, in stainless steel just to, to marry together. It's quite interesting. There's quite a lot of richness and, and, and fatness of fruit, if you like. And then you get hit with this quite lively acidity on the finish. And again, that's probably that concentration of acidity that's come from the lack of juice, really. Um, as people have said, you have very small berries, not only do you concentrate the fruit, but you concentrate certainly in red wines, the tanning structure, and then the white wines, um, particularly importantly, uh, the acidity. So the pH again here seems you know, a really sensible level. Um, new oak is sparingly used that believes around about 20, 25%. Um, and there is a really nice smokiness, partly a, partly from, from the oak, but also just slight, just a hint of reduction, which is rather nice actually. In many ways, that's a classic, classic 2019, really good intensity, but a really refreshing, vibrant finish, just cleaning everything up. Um, I think this will drink a little bit earlier than the Cairo we tasted sooner, uh, um, earlier. So I would probably wait three or four years before I'm, I'm corking the bottle. Um, but I think, yeah, there's, there's, there's perhaps more of a fat and just uh, not quite the same stoniness, if you like, on the Cairo, which will just need that much more time to come round. Um, so that's the Perrier. Um, moving on to wine number five. Um, we, this is another um, acquisition, if you like, following the, the, the our purchase of Domain Direct back in, back in the summer. Um, so this is Domain um, Jean-Marc Boileau, uh, based in Pommard, but very much Polini, Polini focused. Um, Jean-Marc set up the Domain well, I, I might have to check my notes on this one, um, but uh, he set it up in back in 1985, so 30, 35 years ago. Now he has a son and daughter um, working with him uh, now. Um, he was the grandson, uh, coincidentally, of uh, Etienne Sese, um, so there is a nice connection um, with uh, with with. It stays in obviously in Benoit here the, this evening. Um, Refer is is uh, on the Merso borders. Basically, it's uh, the soil is a little bit a little bit richer there. Um, I'm not saying it's a Merso style Pellini, but generally you would expect to see just a little more fat, um, a little more a little bit more expression uh, in youth. Um, Jean Marc is not they they use he, again he. Similar to, to the other guys, 25, 30% new oak. Um, and let's just have a look, see what see what this is uh, this is tasting like. Jason, taking you back to your earlier comment on, on Pellini relative to Chassin being a little bit more powerful and richer in 19, any thoughts on why that is the case? Um, I think the wines tonight have, have somewhat borne that out. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in your thoughts. It is strange. The um, we look at we looked at 2018, and we, which was a really large vintage for for Chardonnay. Unofficially, there were some enormous yields, um, and but that was a good thing actually. I mean, Chardonnay copes very well with with bigger big yields. It doesn't lose concentration, and it maintains that sense of terroir. But I mean, it actually dissipated the heat, and the wines ended up being incredibly. Uh, fresh and vibrant. Um, and then we have 2019, which is the complete reverse. Um, we have a small, small harvest, small, small vintage. Um, and the size, the small size of the vintage has actually um, helped the wines keep their freshness because of this, this idea that 
there's not much juice so everything every everything within the berry if you like is, is concentrated so not just the extract and the tannin but um, and the fruit but also uh, also the acidity um i tr trying to work out why um uh why Pellini with its slightly higher yields and, and chassin would be uh, the wines are slightly bigger. I mean, Benoit would probably be able to, to answer that better than myself, but um, it, it seems that perhaps they, 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 they took a little bit longer to, to come to, to, to full ripeness than, than the Chassins, which was being a very small vintage. So in order to get the phenolic ripeness, obviously uh, the sugar levels would have, would have risen and they couldn't pick um, because they needed that phenolic ripeness. So that, to me, that seems a, a plausible explanation, but we'll ask Benoit shortly when we when we move on to, to his wine. Um, hopefully that answers the question, but only very, only very basically. Um, just quickly looking at the Le Refer. Yeah, that's already showing well. And interestingly, I was I was kind of expecting that to almost be fatter again. But it, once again, I mean, it's going to get boring saying it, but the acidity and the freshness is amazing. The balance is really good. Yes, there probably is a little bit more Merceau style fat, if you like, but there is there's no heaviness whatsoever. There's no it's not over, not overpowering. Beautifully balanced. Um, be interesting to see if it shuts down a little bit um post bottling but actually it's incredibly incredibly open now um again i think this will, this will probably drink quite a bit earlier than, than the pyre um which needs to fill out and sort of put weight onto that stoniness but it, this is already uh quite expressive and really really quite rich i think the oak is well handled um again we're around 25 percent so new oak so not excessive um yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's looking really good. I mean, the vines here um, have, have decent age, so there's there's really nice natural concentration, nothing forced about it. Um, I think it's a really, really nice wine, actually. Um, okay, well, let's 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 move on to uh, to the last wine of the evening, which is the Champagne um, from Etienne Souze. And we'll bring back Benoit um, at this juncture, which seems a sensible thing to do. Um, I mean, it was it was difficult choosing which wine of yours to have in the tasting actually because you have too many good good uh, good vineyards uh, aside from the Grand Cru, the Falatier, Combet. I mean, there's some some wonderful Polini vineyards there. Um, but I remember tasting this, and the Champ Canet really really stood out for me at, at the tasting. Is what, what can you tell us about the vineyard? Yeah. Can we un unmute you? No. Alice? No. We need to un unmute you. Sorry. Unless you can do sign language. <laughs> Any, can we have an un, unmute, anyone? Um, no, no. That's going to... You may have lost Ben. Well, I don't know if you could talk us through some of the other wines, Jason, at the tasting of Soze. Um, what else do we have? Well, yeah, it's a big... It's a big tasting at Soze always. Um, uh, aside from two excellent village wines, including a Chastain Monseigneur, which is one of the great, uh, great plots of, of Chastain. I mean, it sits just below the, the Grand Cruz, and yet it's only, it's only classified as village. So it's a really, really nice site. Um, but as, as Benoit mentioned, um, Guren, um, Perrier, uh, obviously Champagne, Flatier. Combet, uh, which is a little bit of a jewel. Um, I'm probably missing some. And then, and then a incredible lineup of Grand Cru Bienvenue, Batar, Chevalier, 
and and Morache itself. So it's an amazing lineup. And I, I mean, every I've been tasting a sose for a while now, and I think the one thing I do find most years, or pretty much every year, is is that the wines have great diversity in terms of in terms of the of vineyard character. Um, you never get two wines that taste or smell the same. They have wonderful precision um, and also uh, great purity. So the, the, the wonderful terroir differences are there for all to see. And I think as, as Benoit will explain shortly, 2019, certainly for him anyway, was a vintage where um, all those terroir differences were highlighted quite beautifully. Um, Benoit, I gather you're, you're now back with sound. I think so. I think so. It's good. Ah, that's good. Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Much, people would much rather listen to you than me. Um, no, I can speak about Chacané now. Easier. <laughs> uh, first, first, I think it's a, it's a very beautiful cross and a little bit uh, no terroir, but it's a very good localization, uh, just on the top of Combet and uh, Meursault limit just limit to Merceau Perrier. And um, it's, uh, it's of course, uh, it's of course a special terroir and um, it's a, perhaps a little bit more creamy than uh, typical uh, Puligny if you want, but uh, it's a so strong wine, each vintage with a lot of elegance, but on a ripe way and a uh, little bit, um, for me, it's all the time a little bit spicy minerality, spicy balance, and a small creamy touch of Meursault. And it's all the time uh, easy intensity wine and uh, easy tasting, but with uh, with body and uh, with long long way for for age too. And uh, it's very um, complex wine, in fact. How old are the the vines here? It's old vines. It's uh, we have three years, three different years, but uh, the average it's uh, 65 years old, and uh, it's very typical soil for for Burgundy. It's mid slope, little bit. Uh, it's uh, it's yes, it's a light clay, red clay, but a lot of limestone, and perhaps you have uh, between 30, 40 centimeter of soil, not more, and uh, it's. Um, it's all time easy ripeness area, but uh, we picked uh, in general first for for Sose vineyards, and uh, you have all time this uh, crispy uh, yellow Chardonnay and spawn berries and concentration in same time. Like Philippe Perno, I think you started on the 9th the ninth of September. Is that right? Exactly. And again, was was that an easy decision to pick the right date? It's never easy. <laughs> it's never easy. It's all time a combination of different uh, parameters. Um, first for me, and uh, perhaps one of the most important for me, it's uh, testing grapes. And uh, I don't want picked if I don't test good grapes. And uh, not each day, but uh, I, I move in vineyards very currently, just before us, and I won't pick with good testing and uh, total uh, maturity, uh, not too much, but uh, good ripeness. And I'm, uh, I'm not afraid uh, about acidity and balance. And um, I'm quiet with my vineyards and my uh, growing. And that's why sometimes it's, it's not a problem to, to wait a little bit for, for, for pick, for picking. You, when, when you're going through the vineyards, do you base your your decision on taste or on an analytical analysis? Uh, it's 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 three parameters for me. It's uh, my tasting first, analyze of course, and the weather. And uh, after we cross all that, and uh, we take a decision. But uh, sometimes we are a little bit afraid uh, for for weight. Because uh, you wait and your grapes are outside, and it's a whole time uh, special because it's not in the cellar. And when it's in the cellar, it's uh, insecurity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's why sometimes, uh, yeah, you'll you be a little bit afraid with that. But 
you you need you need um, you need to be quiet with uh, with balance, and uh, it's not why uh, it's not if English, sorry, but uh, if it, you can pick early, but uh, sometimes it's not better if you if you wait two, three, four, a few days. I don't know. It's not if you can pick early, but not not uh, not more acidity, not more depend, not so easy. <laughs> And in terms of new oak barrels, what percentage are you using? Well, we use 25 for 25 percent for for Chancagne. Yeah, a little bit more for the Grand Cru. <laughs> Depend <laughs> of the quantity of the Grand Cru. It's uh, <laughs> it's uh, sometime like, like Bienvenue, for example. It's uh, in general, it's two barrels or two and a half. We have never new. Oak. Yeah. And here's a, here's a slightly, uh, what's the word in English? I'm going to say cheeky, but malin, so say the, so that's the word in French. As, as your father-in-law, Gérard, what, what's, what's, what does he think of the 2019s? I think he is, um, uh, he likes wine uh, first, and uh, I think he is a little bit surprised uh, by the result now because uh, with the, the warm condition, uh, everybody have an idea, a first idea, but uh, after testing, it's, uh, it's all not exactly what uh, a lot of people imagine. It's uh, more energetic, like I say, more fresh, more balanced on the top of, of the top level, but uh, it's balanced. That's why you like. Yeah, well, well that's, that's what we all like. <laughs> but, um, uh, okay, well, look, that, I, I mean, I think that's showing beautifully. To me, that's a wine that could age for 15 or 20 years without any problem at all. Yeah, I expect. <laughs> I expect. I, I'm sure it's a very, very good constitution for aged, for well aging. Um, but after, I'm sure a lot of people drink quicker. <laughs> But on, because uh, everybody uh, will be exciting, test uh, this vintage, and uh, it show for me this vintage show well during uh, five years, ten years, and uh, and for for a long time after. Yes, I, I hope that. Well, I'm hoping that um, you you got my my reservation for magnums and, and Jeroboams uh, this morning. So I anyone think that this, this afternoon, uh, we need to speak a little bit. <laughs> Uh, and just just one last question before we let you go. Um, it's been a very strange period. You've had almost no no customers coming to visit, no importers this year. Uh, not not no because I, I meet you, for example. <laughs> but but uh, no, we, we just, just, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, the best, and uh, and. Um, no, less and less than usual, of course. But uh, we keep uh, we keep we keep touched a little bit by video or by phone, depend. But uh, yes, it's very difficult to to speak about wine. We you you need testing. You everybody need testing and need an uh, impression. And that's why we we try some different thing. And I think it's uh, it's better than nothing, of course. But uh, in the cellar, no, it's it's very difficult. Few few people, but uh, not a lot. Well, it, 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 say it is cha challenging uh, environment to, to both make wine and taste wine. But um, I think you've produced, you've made some beautiful wines this year. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Benoit, and thank you um, both um, Loic and uh, Pierre also for joining us. And I'll I'll hand you back uh, hand you back to Sam. I will echo Jason's comments of thanks there. I, I think um, winemakers have done a brilliant job in getting us, and, and, a, and a thank you also to 67. I think tonight we've seen all the wines in, in great condition, and we've had a really interesting picture on, on how good Pellini is in 19. Um, so thank you for tonight. Uh, this is our last tasting of the Cote de Bone. Uh, next week we are heading to the Cote de Nuit, uh, with Vona Nui, which is full on Tuesday, on 
Thursday, I'm back at the helm. Uh, Jason gets a rest uh, for Shomble and Mori, of which there are four places left, if anyone's interested. And we'll get another perspective on the vintage then, because William Kelly of The Wine Advocate is joining me uh, to talk about the vintage as well. So we'll be interested to hear his thoughts. Uh, but thank you to everyone tonight. As always, I will try and get an offer of the wines you've tasted tonight to you via email tonight. Um, but thank you and good night. <laughs>